Hello, welcome to my YouTube channel. So today we're going to learn the anatomy of prostate. You know the prostate is a male accessory sex gland. It's a fibromuscular glandular organ and the prostatic secretions contribute to the seminal fluid. Contractions of the smooth muscle fibers pumps these prostatic secretions during ejaculation into the prostatic urethra separated and remember the female homologue of this prostate gland is paraurethral gland of skin remember can be asked for examination the paraurethral glands of skin is the female homologue of prostate gland now let us see the location of this prostate gland you know prostate gland is a pelvic organ okay so here you can see the prostate gland is present in the lesser pelvis so here we have the urinary bladder this is the urinary bladder just below the neck of the bladder we can see the prostate gland okay that is retropubically behind the pubic symphysis it is situated below the neck of urinary bladder retropubically in front of the ampulla of rectum so here we have the rectum in front of ampulla of rectum below the neck of urinary bladder behind the pubic symphysis now what are this morphology the shape is a more it is inverted cone shaped structure inverted cone shaped structure weighs about 17 to 19 gram width is 4 centimeter length is 3 centimeter so here we have the leg width 4 centimeter and the length is 3 centimeter and the thickness is about 2 centimeter okay you can remember this 4 3 2 this number length is 3 cm, width is 4 cm and the thickness is 2 cm and it has got a peculiarity. So this is one of the organ which is having more width than the length. Prostate is an example of an organ which is wider. Another organs, wider organs are, they are the pituitary gland, pons, cecum and celiac trunk. Remember this also. Okay, the uh, prostate gland is one of the organ having wider okay other organs are pituitary gland pons cecum and celiac trunk what are the external features it is i told you it is an inverted cone shaped structure inverted cone shaped structure it has got an apex so here we have an apex and this is the base here is apex and here is a base and how many surfaces there is an anterior surface there is a posterior surface and two infrolateral surfaces infrolateral surface it has again has got an apex directed downwards base then there is an anterior surface posterior surface and two infrolateral surfaces now let us see the detail in detail you know this is the apex of the gland okay the apex is directed downwards and it is related to the upper layer of urogenital diaphragm this is the urogenital diaphragm so here is the upper layer of urogenital diaphragm here is the lower layer of urogenital diaphragm and this is the deep perineal pouch deep perineal pouch okay the apex is directed downwards and is related to the upper layer of urogenital diaphragm urogenital diaphragm and you can see the base is directed upwards and is related to the neck of urinary bladder neck of urinary bladder okay and the junction between the base of the prostate and the urinary bladder is marked by a circular groove there is a circular groove then say anterior surface so here you are seeing the sagittal section of the male pelvis so here we have the pubic symphysis you are seeing the urinary bladder rectum and the prostate and the seminal vesicle okay so this is the anterior surface of the gland anterior surface is directed forwards okay it is related to the posterior aspect of the pubic symphysis pubic symphysis okay just behind the pubic symphysis there is a space so that space is known as the retropubic space or cave of rhizius retropubic space or cave of rhizius and it is covered by extra peritoneal fat and here there is some venous vesicle venous plexus is also present in this retropubic space of rhizius so the anterior surface of the, the prostate gland is related to the 
retropebic space of red cs then coming to the posterior surface so here we have the anterior surface of the gland and this is the posterior surface you know posterior surface lies in front of the rectal ampulla there is a rectum this is a rectal ampulla rectal ampulla and there is a fascia in between that fascia is known as the fascia of denon villiers fascia of denon villiers let us see what is the fascia of denon villiers so here you are seeing the urinary bladder and this is the <coughs> rectum and anal canal okay so what exactly happening is so i'm just drawing here so here we have the pubic symphysis okay just below behind the pubic symphysis we have the urinary bladder and here we have the prostate okay and here we have the rectum i'm drawing the rectum over here this is the rectum so during the early fetal stage you can see that the peritoneum that is the peritoneum the parietal peritoneum lying in the anterior abdominal wall here we have the anterior abdominal wall it lines the superior aspect of the urinary bladder and it runs downwards up to the here we have the urogenital diaphragm up to the urogenital diaphragm and lines to the rectum that means the urinary bladder uh, then we have the prostate and we have the seminal vesicle these structures are completely this particular rectum separate to rectum during the early fetal life okay when later what happens actually the distal part of this particular pouch disappears okay distal part disappears producing a bilaminar septum producing a bilaminar septum there as a proximal part persist that pro persistent proximal part is forming the rectovesical pouch and the distal obliterated part forms the fascia of denenviller fascia of denenviller remember fascia of denenviller is a double layered structure it has got a double layer structure something like that so here we have the rectovesical pouch okay anteriorly it is related to the urinary bladder and the prostate and posteriorly there is a rectum rectum okay and there is a cavity or potential space between these two layers that is known as the space of denon viller space of denon viller okay remember what is fascia of denon viller fascia of denon viller is the uh, distal part of the rectovesical pouch okay and it is a double layered structure anterior layer and posterior layer anterior layer is, is having a firm connection with the or it is firmly attached to the posterior aspect of the uh, prostate and the posterior layer is loosely attached to the rectum loosely attached to the rectum and this the i told you in between there is a fascia there is a, sorry there is a space and there is a, that potential space is used by the surgeon that is during a procedure called perineal prostatectomy so we will come to this later detail perineal prostatectomy that means approach of the prostate gland through the perineum through the perineum here we have the perineum approach of the prostate through the perineum the resectoscope or the instrument is passes or the surgeon introduces the instruments through this fascia or so the space of denenviller space of denenviller okay and one thing you should remember is if posteriorly this particular fascia of denenviller is closely related to this rectum okay any failure in the insertion of the instruments may damage the rectum remember this damage the rectum okay another importance of this fascia in denon villar is the prostatic carcinoma okay seldom enters this facial compartment but it does not extend into the rectum that means the carcinoma of this particular prostate gland the spread of this carcinoma is limited by this septum from the rectum okay so that is the surgical and the clinical importance of this fascia of denon villars it has got two infralateral surface are there so here we have the infralateral surface infralateral surface is, is, is are related to two muscles that is we have the pelvic diaphragm that is one levator and a and the upper part we have the obturator internus that means two muscles that is the obturator internus obturator internus above and levator and a muscle below it is related to two structures remember the infralateral surface now let us see the structure of prostate gland so in the beginning i told you the nature of the gland is fibromuscular what exactly it is fibro muscular glandular structure fibromuscular glandular structure it is formed by the fiber 
मसल एंड ग्लैंडुलर पॉट ओके मेनली फॉर्म बाई द फाइब्रो मस्कुलर स्ट्रोमा एंड ग्लैंडुलर पैरेंट गए पैरेंट गए मीन्स द ग्लैंड स्ट्रक्चर सो दिस इज द फाइब्रो मस्कुलर स्ट्रोमा एंड दिस इज द ग्लैंडुलर स्ट्रक्चर ओके द परसेंटेज इज द फाइब्रस टिश्यू वन फोर्थ इज फॉर्म बाई द फाइब्रस टिश्यू वन फोर्थ इज बाय द मस्कुलर टिश्यू एंड द वन बाय टू इज फॉर्म इज कॉन्स्टिट्यूटेड बाय द ग्लैंडुलर टिश्यू एंड ग्लैंड आर ट्यूबलो एल्वेलर ग्लैंड आर दे ट्यूबलो एल्वेलर ग्लैंड इट्स अरेंजमेंट थ्री कॉन्सेंट्रेट रिंग्स आर देर ओके सो हियर दिस इज द यूरिथ्रा यूरिथ्रा ओके द प्रोस्टेट ग्लैंड इज ट्रवर्सड बाय द यूरिथ्रा ओके अराउंड दी यूरिथ्रा वी हैव म्यूकोसल ग्लैंड स्मॉल म्यूकोसल ग्लैंड जस्ट नेक्स्ट हियर वी हैव द सब म्यूकोसल ग्लैंड एंड आउटर मोस्ट पार्ट वी हैव द चीफ और द मेजर प्रोस्टैटिक ग्लैंड मेजर प्रोस्टैटिक ग्लैंड एंड द डक्ट ऑफ ईच ग्लैंड फाइनली ओपन इन टू द प्रोस्टैटिक यूरिथ्रा प्रोस्टैटिक urethra okay and the lumen of this particular uh, uh, prostatic glands okay may have there some secretions that is known as the corpora amelicea corpora amelicea corpora amelicea normally it is present in older individuals corpora amelicea now so here is a diagrammatic representation of the prostate gland prostate and its glandular pod so here we have the prostatic urethra this is a prostatic urethra okay so very close to this prostatic urethra we have the mucosal glands outer we have the submucosal glands and periphery along the periphery we have the major prostatic glands major prostatic glands and all these you know the nature is tubulo alveolar glands and the glands finally opens into the prostatic urethra now the prostate is divided into some lobes okay let us see what are they so here in this diagram just have a look on this diagram you can see the urinary this is a prostatic urethra anterior to prostatic urethra we have the anterior lobe on either side we have lateral lobe just behind we have the median lobe and there is posterior lobe okay so you are seeing the sagittal section so here we have the you are seeing the two lateral lobes of the prostate glands okay this is the anterior so lateral view anterior surface and the posterior surface the idea is the, at the posterior surface we have the seminal vesicles are there seminal vesicles the seminal vesicle duct of the seminal vesicle traverses the uh, uh, this prostate gland and finally opens into the prostatic urethra this is the prostatic urethra okay that is the posterior part is divided by two areas by the duct of seminal vesicle okay the area above is known as the median lobe median lobe and the area below is the posterior lobe posterior lobe so totally how many lobes we have we have five lobes there is anterior lobe two lateral lobes then we have the median lobe and the posterior lobes now see the anterior lobe you can see this is the anterior this is posterior anterior lobe is located in front of the prostatic urethra in front of the prostatic urethra remember this is a non glandular part this anterior lobe does not have any glandular tissue okay you can see there is no glandular tissue present over here and it is normally called as the isthmus the meaning of isthmus is the connecting structure isthmus is the something which is connecting together okay so isthmus is the or the anterior lobe is also known as isthmus and remember anterior lobe is non glandular now posterior lobe okay so here you are seeing the prostate gland here is the seminal vesicle ducto seminal vesicle so this is the median lobe and this is the posterior lobe posterior lobe you can see the posterior lobe is present below and behind the duct ejaculatory duct this is the ejaculatory duct below and behind the ejaculatory duct and one thing you should remember the primary carcinoma of the prostate gland starts in the posterior lobe so the importance of the posterior lobe is primary carcinoma originates there originates here in the posterior lobe in the posterior lobe now coming to the lateral lobes i already told you there are two lateral lobes are there and these lateral lobes lies 
on either side of the prostatic urethra and anteriorly these two lateral lobes are connected by means of isthmus that is known as the isthmus connected by isthmus now very important is the median lobe okay where you can see the median lobe so here in this diagram you can see the posterior surface we have the seminal vesicle here here we have the ejaculate duct the part of the lobe lies above and in front of the ejaculated duct is known as the or it's constitute the median lobe median lobe okay and you can see that the median lobe it projects into the posterior aspect of the urinary bladder okay and creates an eminence at the apex of the trigonum vesicle and it is known as a uvula vesicle uvula vesicle again the median lobe projects into this particular median lobe projects into the urinary bladder and creates a ridge like structure is known as a urethral crust crust crista urethralis or veru montanum veru montanum remember this importance it is having important veru montanum what exactly is the veru montanum you know the this particular median lobe okay median lobe projects into the posterior aspect of the urinary bladder creates a ridge over there okay so this is the ridge you are seeing this ridge over here okay so this ridge is the veru montanum veru montanum or the urethral crest urethral crest and this median lobe consists of most of the glandular tissue okay and it is a site of adenoma site of adenoma you know adenoma is the non cancerous growth of glandular tissue is known as the adenoma adenoma so two things remember the median lobe is a site of adenoma and the posterior lobe is a site of origin of carcinoma now so here again you can see the ha huh, this was the median lobe so the median lobe makes a projection over there okay there is a projection okay and below the projection there is a crest urethral crest you are seeing a projection called uvula vesicae and below the uvula vesicae there is the veru montanum veru montanum okay so this is this veru montanum or the uvula vesicae is produced by the median lobe produced by the median lobe median lobe now what are the zones of prostate okay so surgeon uh, normally consider the zones rather than the lobes of the uh, uh, prostate gland what are the zones of prostate gland see there are four zones are there so first one is a transitional zone where you can see the transitional zone it is surrounding the prostatic urethra the area surrounding the prostatic urethra is known as a transitional zone which constitute about 5% of the glandular tissue or the glandular tissue of the prostate is divided into four zones the first one is a transitional zone the glandular tissue the area around the prostatic urethra is the transitional zone then coming to the central zone central zone the area surrounds the right and left ejaculatory duct we have two ejaculatory ducts right and left that area surrounding forms the central zone central zone it constitutes about 25% of the glandular tissues 25% of the glandular tissue next one is a peripheral zone so you can see just look at the peripheral zone so peripheral zone okay it constitute about 70% of 70% of the glandular tissue present in the peripheral zone okay where you can see it is present in the posterior aspect as well as the lateral aspect of the prostate gland posterior as well as two lateral part occupies the peripheral zone which constitute the center or it includes the central zone and part of the transitional zone central zone the whole of the central zone and the part of the transitional zone is coming in the peripheral zone peripheral zone and there is anterior zone anterior zone you know there is an anterior lobe which is non glandular okay where you can see only some smooth muscle fibers and urethral sphincter smooth muscle fiber and urethral sphincter is present in the anterior zone so these are the zones of prostatic glands okay so what are they we have the four zones are there transitional zone central zone peripheral zone and anterior zone so so tell me what is the transitional zone where you can see transitional zone is 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 constituted is constituting only 5% of the glands and it surrounds the prostatic urethra and the central zone 
is the area around the ejaculated duct and the peripheral zone about 70% constituted by the posterior as well as the lateral part of the gland which also including which includes the central zone and the part of the transverse zone and there is an anterior zone or anterior region which is non glandular now what are the structures within the prostate okay what i can see here is in the is a prostate gland you are seeing urinary bladder here see there is an ejaculated duct two ejaculated ducts are there two ejaculated ducts and the prostatic urethra two ejaculated duct and prostatic urethra two structures are present in the prostate gland okay and see here you are seeing the prostatic urethra okay at the prostatic urethra you can see there is a urethral crest or verum montanum i already told you okay at the verum montanum at the central part there is a structure called prostatic utricle prostatic utricle and this prostatic utricle is represents the caudal end of the fused mullerian duct remember this normally asked for examination so, prostatic utricle represents the caudal end of the fused mullerian duct capsule of the prostate you know prostate gland is covered by some coverings are there okay that is known as a prostatic coverings or prostatic capsule okay there are, there is a true capsule and false capsule okay so what is true capsule you can see the whole of the structure is covered by a fibrous structure that fibrous structure is known as the true capsule it is a condensed peripheral fibrous stroma of the gland peripheral fibrous stroma of the gland constitute the true capsule and the fictitious or the false capsule fictitious capsule or the false capsule it is also known as a prostatic sheath it is a peritoneal folding peritoneal covering that is in the pelvis you know peritoneal deflections or a peritoneum enters the pelvis and divides into parietal layer and visceral layer okay visceral layer covers the pelvic organs so here that visceral layer forms the false capsule false capsule and one thing to remember this particular false capsule okay it covers the prostate as well as the urinary bladder urinary bladder and the prostate gland is covered by a single peritoneal covering okay that is the false capsule that is the false capsule false capsule then another one is known as a surgical or pathological capsule what is a surgical or pathological capsule you know what happens if there is an enlargement of the prostate gland okay there is an adenoma okay so here you can see the growth or the adenoma of the gland so when there is an adenoma so it compresses the prostate thick stroma you know so prostate is formed by this glandular tissue and the stroma okay so whenever there is an adenoma in the glandular tissue it compresses the stroma and the stroma is It appears so stroma appears like that of a capsule, okay. So that is known as the surgical or pathological capsule. Surgical or pathological. That is the compressed part of the gland is named as the surgical or pathological capsule. So here we have the uh, growth for the adenoma and the prostatic tissue itself appears as a covering or the capsule that forms the surgical or pathological capsule. now remember there is a true capsule and false capsule okay between the true and false capsule remember there is a venous plexus okay the venous plexus around this prostate is the prostatic venous plexus prostatic venous plexus see prostatic venous plexus okay and i already told you that the prostate as well as the urinary bladder is having a common sheath false capsule okay so here this is the venous plexus of the seminal uh, urinary bladder that is known as the vesicle venous plexus vesicle venous plexus here the venous plexus is present between the true and false capsule between the true and <coughs> false capsule then what are the structures provide support to the prostate gland there is a fixation and suspension is done by there are some ligaments called pubo prostatic ligament i told you there is so here we have the pubic symphysis here we have the urinary bladder here you can see the prostate gland there are some ligaments that is called from the pubic symphysis to the gland there is a pubo prostatic ligament the same way here we have the pubo vesical ligament also okay so the pubo prostatic ligament and below we have the urogenital diaphragm is there urogenital diaphragm urogenital diaphragm 
then again above it is related to the urinary bladder the prostate and the urinary bladder is covered by a single fold capsule in that way it, it gives an indirect support <coughs> and the prostatic fascia or the prostatic sheath itself is a uh, support and posteriorly you know it is supported by the fascia of den and builder fascia of den and builder we have already discussed so these are the ligaments or the supports of this prostate gland is supported by pubocyte ligament urogenital diaphragm urinary bladder prostatic sheath and the fascia of den and billiards now the prostatic carcinoma so the prostatic carcinoma happens above over the age of 50 years okay 70 to 75 percent of this prostatic cancer affects the peripheral zone peripheral zone which includes i told you already the posterior lobe mainly and the 25 percent of the carcinoma is affected in the or it affects in the transitional zone transitional zone okay and medically what happens if someone having a prostatic carcinoma so the symptoms include pain in the perineum definitely urinary obstruction and the trouble in urination okay normally the pr is the per rectal examination pr is per rectal examination examination dr is also same that is a digital rectal examination then it's known as the dre okay so during if there is a carcinoma or the growth okay so before that let me see one more thing so here seeing the section of the prostate gland if you see this gland from above see the posterior surface of the gland shows a median sulcus or a median groove okay normally so whenever there is a carcinoma of the external world, this median groove disappears median groove disappears so during this pr or per rectal or the digital rectal examination unusual hard rigid prostate is felt and there is an absence of the median groove in the posterior surface on its posterior surface there is a median groove normally so if there is a, a growth extra growth unusual growth they uh, we cannot feel this median groove during digital rectal examination digital rectal examination okay and the metastasis of the prostatic carcinoma typically appears in the lumbar vertebra and the pelvis okay now coming to arterial supply okay you know it is present just below the neck of the urinal bladder so it is supplied by the inferior vesicle artery in front of the rectum so we have the medial middle rectal artery and also there's an internal peroneal artery internal peroneal artery you know the peroneal canal okay it is related to the medial aspect of the ischia or the uh, tuberosity of the ischia okay there is a peritoneal canal so these three blood sub blood well supplies blood to the the gland that is a inferior vesicle artery middle rectal artery and internal purental artery and venous drainage there are a plexus of i already told you between the two capsule and fold capsule there is a venous plexus you know venous plexus is present between the true and false capsule okay so one thing remember this vesicle venous plexus that is the prostatic venous plexus is continuous above the vesicle venous plexus so we have already seen one diagram okay and it receives blood from the pelvis also there is a deep dorsal vein so deep dorsal vein drains into the prostatic venous plexus prostatic venous plexus the prostatic venous plexus runs backwards and finally drains into the internal iliac vein internal iliac vein and the internal iliac vein goes upwards forms the common iliac vein and finally opens into the inferior vena cava inferior vena cava now some more uh, uh, words about the venous drainage okay so I, we have already seen that it drains into internal iliac veins via the posterior ligaments of the urinary bladder okay and what happens the prostatic venous plexus goes backwards into internal iliac veins and finally go to this ivc okay so ivc opens into the right atrium okay so from the right atrium you know rest of the uh, blood I mean, enters into the other circulation okay so this pathway explains remember this point the metastasis of cancer or prostate into the heart and lungs okay the prostatic carcinoma may metastasis into the heart and lungs what is the reason anatomical reason is 
the venous drainage from the prostatic venous plexus drains into the internal iliac veins from where it goes to the ivc okay so from the ivc it goes right atrium from the if it goes to right atrium the metastasis can occur in the in the, the heart okay from the right atrium it goes to the for the pulmonary circulation so the metastasis can occur into the lungs also into the lungs also okay this again another uh, route is this prostatic venous plexus okay goes back okay this prostatic venous plexus goes back and enters into the vertebral venous plexus you we know the sacrum is there through the sacral foramina anterior sacral foramina it enters into the vertebral sacral canal and where it is having connection with the vertebral venous plexus okay through the vertebral venous plexus of bath stern it can go into the it goes upwards okay through the vertebral canal into the intracranial dural venous sinuses intracranial dural venous sinuses remember this pathway describes the metastasis of cancer of prostate into the vertebral column and the brain so these two points you remember normally as for examinations like anatomical base of metastasis of prostate cancer to the vertebral column and the brain or anatomical basis for the metastasis of prostate cancer into heart and lungs okay so remember these two points important for the examination now lymphatic drainage so the lymph from the prostate is draining into internal iliac external iliac nodes and the sacral group of lymph nodes okay and the nerve supply the nerve plexus which is supplying this urinary vein or prostate is sympathetic supply is by the superior hypogastric plexus the preganglionic sympathetic fibers originate from the l1 and l2 spinal segments and the parasympathetic supply is offered by the splanchanic nerves that is the pelvic splanchanic nerves through s2 s3 and s4 now very important point that are the changes of age related changes of the prostate again this also normally asked for examinations okay age related changes okay you know in youth or below puberty okay you know what is the nature of the prostate gland fibromuscular glandular structure fibromuscular glandular structure okay before puberty the organ is only fibromuscular only fibromuscular that means glands are not fully developed glands are not fully developed and the ducts are rudimentary okay at puberty what happens normally you know common sense what happens under the influence of this testosterone glandular structure develops glandular structure develops okay so when the glandular structure develops the size of the gland increases normally right there is a fast proliferation of these prostatic follicles which begin secretion during puberty or at puberty the uh, glandular structure glandular tissue starts developing more and more glandular structures increases the size of the gland and this gland starts the secretion during the third decade adding after 30 years what happens atypical epithelial infoldings in the lumen okay at the lumen of this tubulo alveolar glands there form some uh, follicles fo well, foldings you can say follicles okay foldings of this epithelial infolding for example so when we uh, we have already uh, seen the histology of the microscopic structure of the prostate gland the mucosa has so many foldings are there you know these foldings so these foldings present during the third decade and during the fourth decade what happen size of the prostate there is not change in the size of the prostate okay lumen slowly vanish and amyloid bodies starts appearing in the prostate you know amyloid secretions amyloid bodies or the prostatic uh, this one amyloid uh, bodies start appearing during the fourth decade then what about what, what is the status of this one during the fifth decade some measures of prostatic hypertrophy in some cases the gland is reduced in size and there is little bit of atrophy okay so these are the changes age related change of the prostate let us see once again what are the change in youth or below puberty the gland is only fibromuscular there is no glands during puberty what happen under the effect of this testosterone the more and more glandular structure starts developing as a result the size of the gland increases and there is a sign of secretion there is secretion during the third decade atypical epithelial infoldings appears in the lumen next the fourth decade the size 
remains the same but the lumen slowly vanishing and there is the amyl uh, appearance of amyloid bodies during the fifth decade there is a little bit of prostatic hypertrophy in some cases there is senile atrophy then what is very important benign prostatic hypertrophy bph again ask for examination what is bph benign prostatic hypertrophy i told you benign means what benign is the non cancerous non carcinogenic non cancerous cancerous non cancerous so what exactly simply it is the inflammation of the prostate gland it's a non cancerous enlargement and already i told you median lobe is prone for hypertrophy median lobe is prone for hypertrophy i told you already adenoma adenoma is the non cancerous growth of glandular tissue okay and the plural is the adenomata adenoma is the singular word and the plural is adenomata okay and it is caused by the uh, 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 dihydrotestosterone dst hormone dihydrotestosterone and normally bph happens above the age of 50 above the age of 50 now so here what happens if there is just look at the diagram so here is the urinary bladder here is the prostate okay what happens we have the median lobe here what happens if there is enlargement of the prostate median lobe you can see the median lobe is enlarged okay normally it obstructs the urinary i mean it it causes urinary obstruction it obstructs the urethra prostatic urethra okay another thing is there so during this growth what happens there a pouch is formed behind the prostate that is known as the post prostatic pouch post prostatic pouch a pouch develops that is known as the post prostatic pouch then what happen the urine starts get collecting in the post prostatic pouch post prostatic pouch so here you can see this is the median lobe enlarges okay and here is the collection of stagnant or the pouch stagnant urine so just let us let us see once again here in this diagram one more thing remember so here at the junction between the urinary bladder and the prostatic urethra there is a internal urethral sphincter internal urethral sphincter and here we have the external urethral sphincter internal urethral sphincter is here junction between the urinary bladder and prostate okay and so below at the apex of the prostate we have the external urethral sphincter external urethral sphincter so in this diagram during this enlargement of the prostate okay so what happens this enlargement happen inside the internal urethral sphincter internal urethral sphincter internal urethral sphincter okay then what are the i mean i mean uh, symptoms of this particular median bph benign prostatic hypertrophy there is increase of fre frequency of urination urgency of urination another thing is a difficulty in starting and stopping of the urination and sense of incomplete emptying of the urinary bladder so these are the symptoms of benign prostatic hypertrophy bph in the severe stage of uh, urinary retress, retention urinary obstruction or urinary retention is prostatic urethra is obstructed as a result what happens actually the urine get collected in the urinary bladder okay after a limit beyond a limit what happens actually the muscle muscular wall of the urine that means the urine get collected in the urinary bladder there is an obstruction the urine is not flowing here okay kidney keeps on producing the urine and the urinary bladder keeps on getting filled but there is no outflow okay so there is a distension of the urinary bladder okay beyond the limit the urinary bladder cannot expand after that limit what happens actually the muscle fibers of the urinary bladder exerts a pressure okay exerts a pressure on to the urine as a result what happens actually the muscle fibers of this particular urinary bladder become prominence and there is a trabeculated appearance trabeculated appearance of the urinary bladder so that particular condition is known as the trabeculated bladder trabeculated bladder trabeculated bladder now coming to prostatectomy 
what is prostatectomy you know the surgical removal remember it's a surgical removal of the prostate gland is the prostatectomy okay or the adenoma okay and so here one thing is remember the adenoma is enucleated leaving behind the capsules and the prostatic venous plexus you know we have the prostate gland here okay there is a two capsule there is a false capsule urinary bladder false capsule between the true and false capsule there is a venous plexus enucleation means removal of this adenoma removal of this adenoma okay so adenoma enucleation of this adenoma is done leaving behind the prostatic capsule that means during this prostatectomy this new capsule of the prostate gland is not removed that is only that adenoma is removed leaving behind the prostatic capsule why because if you open up the prostatic capsule okay there may be the fact uh, the, the rupture of this venous plexus and leads to severe bleeding severe bleeding okay so that is why the new uh, this capsule is not removed during prostatectomy another thing is there i told you between the prostate gland and the urinary bladder there is a internal urethral sphincter internal urethral sphincter or below we have the external urethral sphincter external urethral sphincter so what happens actually during this procedure prostatectomy the there is the damage to the internal urethral sphincter damage to the internal urethral sphincter see i'm just drawing over here just look at this one so here we have the urinary bladder here we have the prostate seminal vesicle and here we have the penile urethra passes through the penis okay so here so here we have the what's occurring there urogenital diaphragm urogenital diaphragm so here we have the internal urethral sphincter so here we have the external urethral sphincter okay so during this operation prostatectomy what happened there is a rupture or damage to the internal urethral sphincter okay during ejaculation what happened the contraction of the prostate gland contraction of the seminal vesicles okay it 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 uh, the forceful contraction ejects these secretions into the urethra into the urethra okay so here when it ejects into the uh, prostatic urethra at the same time what happens actually during ejaculation there is a constriction of the prostate gland constriction of the uh, seminal vesicle and the constriction of the internal urethral sphincter internal urethral sphincter so which prevents the entry of semen into the urinary bladder so here what happens during this procedure of the prostatectomy the damage the internal urethral sphincter will be damaged so this damaged because of this damaged internal urethral sphincter okay so this semen during ejaculation enters directly into the urinary bladder into the urinary bladder so what happens the patient become infertile or sterile since the mechanism of the internal urethral sphincter is touched and the semen enters the urinary bladder during ejaculation remember this point okay once again after prostatectomy the patient becomes infertile or sterile since the mechanism of internal urethral sphincter is touched and the semen enters into the urinary bladder during ejaculation there are different types of uh, prostatectomy the procedure can be done suprapubic retropubic perineal and transurethral transurethral and now it is most of this adenomatous enlargement of the prostate are resected through or transurethrally transurethrally now let us see so we have already seen okay again can be asked for examinations what is that in bph benign prostatic hypertrophy the adenoma is enucleated leaving behind the capsule of the prostate gland reason kya hai what is the reason the space between the true and false capsule is occupied by the prostatic venous plexus you can see the prostatic venous plexus during enucleation the plane between the adenomatous mass and the surgical capsule is cleaved the adenoma is removed leaving behind the contents of peripheral part of the capsule disturbance of the capsule i already told you leads to severe bleeding severe bleeding you can take down this slide and <clears throat> one more thing you remember so normally <clears throat> the capsule of the thyroid gland and the prostate gland is compared okay the thing is you can see the thyroid gland so here again we have the false capsule inside we have the true capsule 
inside there is the venous plexus venous plexus where you can see the venous plexus in case of thyroid gland the venous plexus is present inside the true capsule inside the true capsule but in prostate gland so it is a diagrammatic representation there is a false capsule then it's a venous plex um, uh, true capsule false capsule true capsule venous plexus okay and here in prostate there is a false capsule true capsule venous plexus venous plexus is present between the false and true capsule here the venous plexus is present deep to the true capsule deep to the true capsule that is a difference and normally it is compared and it normally asks for examination also so here remember Listen, the venous plexus of the thyroid gland, unlike that of the prostate gland, which is located deep to the capsule. Thus, to avoid hemorrhage or to avoid hemorrhage during thyroidectomy, the thyroid gland is removed together with the capsule. Okay, this also used for examinations. Okay, like what is anatomical basis of the um, uh, give or give reasons. Like during thyroidectomy, the thyroid gland is removed along with the capsule. It's got reason. Here, or another question can be asked, give reasons, during prostatectomy, the prostate gland is removed, leaving behind the capsule. Capsule is not removed in prostatectomy, capsule also removed in thyroidectomy. So, remember this also. Now, so I told you there are different uh, types of prostatectomy the first one is a suprapubic prostatectomy what is suprapubic ectomy prostatectomy so here remember these are pubic symphysis and the abdominal wall umbilicus so here we have the urinary bladder we have the urinary bladder so here you can see the prostate gland okay so this particular procedure suprapubic prostatectomy incision is given suprapubically suprapubic infra umbilical incision directly enters into the urinary bladder through the urinary bladder prostate gland is approached prostate gland is supposed to the urinary bladder that is why it's known as a transvesical prostatectomy transvesical so here suprapubic means the cavity of the bladder it is performed by the cavity incision is given above the pubic symphysis enters into the cavity and the incision again given on the anterior aspect of the urinary bladder enters into the urinary bladder through the urinary bladder the prostate gland is supposed that is why it's also known as a transvesical prostatectomy transvesical prostatectomy okay now the second one is the retropubic you know there is a retropubic space or the cave of fritz yes so here the urinary bladder you are seeing the pubic symphysis okay the receptoscope or the instrument is passes through the retropubic space retropubic space here the urinary bladder is not disturbed and the advantage of this method is better visualization of the prostatic cavity better uh, visualization of this one and remember the dorsal vein of penis i told you prostatic venous plexus okay there is a vein called dorsal venous dorsal vein deep dorsal vein of the venous plexus so in this procedure dorsal vein of penis and this tribut tributaries are ligated okay that is a retropubic prostatectomy retropubic prostatectomy next one is perineal okay perineal perineal so that means approach through the perineum. The approach is through the perineum. Okay. The in between, I told you there is a fascia of Dan and Willer. There is a uh, I mean uh, behind we have the rectum. So here we have the prostate and the urinary bladder. Okay. So here in the perineal approach, the receptoscope is passes through the perineum, passes through the perineum. Okay. Or through the potential space between the den and den and their space, den and their space, and uh, another one is called the last one is a transurethral resection of prostate. Is asked again asked for examination T U R P. Okay, is asked for examination. What is T U R P? T U R P is transurethral resection of prostate. T U R P. So here the resectoscope. Okay, the instrument is passes or instrument is inserted through the penile urethra or the urethra okay so this is the turp and one thing i told you about the venu montarum remember the venu montarum venu montarum is a urethral crest okay so venu montarum remember the surgical it's a landmark it's a surgical landmark in this procedure surgical landmark because distal to the venu montarum you know here we have the 
uh, internal urethral sphincter and here we have the external urethral sphincter external urethral sphincter okay in what way venum mentorum is a surgical landmark okay just below the venum mentorum there lies the external urethral sphincter external urethral sphincter and i already told you that in during the prostatectomy there is the compromise of internal urethral sphincter there is the damage to the internal urethral sphincter so in such patients only the external urethral sphincter is left to uh, uh, protect to or the, to save this ebs that is external urethral sphincter external urethral eus external urethral sphincter so when the surgeon looks for the venum mentorum and the resection is done by looking up to the venum mentorum or if it goes downwards it may damage the external urethral sphincter so that was all about the anatomy of the prostate hope you enjoyed the session if you really find this video is useful please share it with your friends thank you so much